Welcome to the lecture on the biology of aging. I'm Carmel Batando Dyer, and I am a professor of uh, geriatric medicine at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. I am the executive uh, director for the Consortium on Aging and uh, the principal investigator on this, the grant for the Houston Geriatric Education Center. Our center is funded through HRSA, the Health Resources and Service Administration in the Department of Health and Human Services. The grant was initially funded in 2007 and renewed and running currently now in 2014. The learning objectives are as follows. Today I will be defining aging and four main characteristics of the aging process. I'll describe changes that occur in the aging cell, describe the theories of aging, and differentiate between normal aging, usual aging, and successful aging. But in that part of the talk, which is about the second half, I will be focusing on the very practical aspects of caring for older patients. So let me begin. Many people ask, what makes geriatric medicine any different from any other field of medicine? You may be in the practice of internal medicine or family medicine or any other field in any other discipline and wonder what makes somebody a geriatric patient. The most important thing in dealing with all the variations in people as they get older is to understand the biology of aging. We can't memorize the dose in every single medication and there are not enough papers written that addressed every clinical challenge that we will face in dealing with the older patient. But what we can do is fully understand what's known about the biology of aging and prescribe and treat and care for older patients with those things in mind. So let me begin. I wonder how many of you recognize this gentleman here. So this is Jack LaLanne back in 1954 and he was a super healthy guy. He was a bodybuilder at that time and just so you know I wasn't even born at that point and this is not from my personal collection but it's very clear to see why Mr. Lillane lived to be into his 90s and still very active and vibrant. It's because back in the 50s, he exercised and ate well and he kept up these practices into his old age. Not all patients are as vigorous and as healthy as Mr. Lillane was. In this slide set here, this woman, although alert and able to walk, is much more frail. And so what we have to understand that you have on one end of the extreme, the Jack LaLanne's, on the other extreme, you might have the woman in the previous slide who uh, is frailer and needs more help. And so it's very important that we as clinicians don't put people into a box based on age. Instead, we try to look at their biological age, not their chronic age. In the same way that in a pediatric practice, one doesn't consider newborns the same as 16-year-olds. We have to do the same thing because we have just as heterogeneous a population to treat and care for. So under learning objective A, I'm going to define aging in the four main characteristics of the aging process. These are destructive processes, progressive, irreversible, and ongoing processes, intrinsically determined processes, and universal ones. So destructive processes. From age 25 to age 85, we have a 130-fold risk of death. And so your organs decrease in capacity linearly, heart function, liver function, etc., but at different rates depending on the organ system, and we'll get into that in a bit later. We also have reduced response to stimuli. Maybe you can think of an example from your experience. So, for instance, 
noise level. As we age, late 40s and 50s, we may not hear as well. So there's a reduced response to that external stimuli. The same thing as we get older, we develop cataracts and thickening of the lens in, in our eyes. And so we may need more stimuli to achieve the same results. And of course, all of us recognize that as we age, we have increased susceptibility to disease states. And we'll talk about some of those disease states it's very important that we understand this precipice that many of our older patients are standing on the corner of. So for instance, when we're younger, you can see, and that's demonstrated on the left hand of the slide, we've got lots of reserve. But as we age, almost linearly, we rely more and more on our physiologic reserves. That's why somebody who's younger and more robust may withstand a bout of pneumonia in a week in the hospital much better than a frailer, older patient who is already operating on all the physiologic reserves. And so what happens to our patients is when they get to the point where the reserves are all in use, they need to withstand some serious health event. They can fall off the precipice. This concept, this theory, is called homeostenosis. So, a couple of slides ago, you saw the pig in the boot, and that slide addressed chronologic age versus biologic age. Well, we know that the chronologic age is really how long have you lived? X amount of years old. Biological age is how old is your body. We see so many patients in their 60s and even some in their 50s who have been racked with illness and have functional problems, maybe even cognitive problems. Or we see people who are quite elderly and robust in 90, however they can drive and they serve on boards and they volunteer and they care for children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And so what we want to avoid is putting someone in a box strictly on the basis of their chronological age and any good geriatrician or gerontologist and geriatrics is the science of, of uh, older people and gerontology is the study in, in more general terms but any one of us interested in the care of older people has to be able to sort out this issue. Life expectancy is another, is another term we see a lot in epidemiologic studies. And it means the average number of years remaining for a living being or the average for a class of living beings of a given age to live. And so here are some tables, a table rather, with some lines on it that describe life expectancy at birth by sex and race for the last 50 years of the 20th century. And so let's take a look at this. So the highest survival is white females. And all races, women, are right up there. African American females rise up in that as the years progressed, while African American males remained low. These changes in life expectancy had to do with improved public hygiene and the discovery of antibiotics. But there's been further prolongation in the 70s and 80s with improved treatments for cardiovascular disease. In fact, many studies have looked at the health disparities between African Americans, Latinos, whites, etc. And, uh, and these studies are drilling down on these disparities and trying to resolve them so that in the future we hope those lines on the life expectancy chart to become closer and closer together. So characteristics of aging, so why are things different? Well, we all know mortality increases exponentially, but the biochemical composition of our tissues changes as well. We can all think of an example in the skin. As we age, our skin becomes thinner. And the idea of pulling the skin and seeing if it tents to detect dehydration doesn't really work in the older patient because their skin has become thinner and tense anyway. Physiological capacity decreases. 
the ability to maintain homeostasis diminishes and the susceptibility and vulnerability to disease also increases. And it's, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing that we see, you know, if you look right now in hospitals, more than 40 to 50 percent of hospitals other than children's hospitals contain individuals over the age of 65. More than 60 percent of all elective surgeries in 2014 in this country occur in people over the age of 65. And so it's pretty clear that something happens between the time you're born and, and uh, 80 and uh, 90 years old and it's this linear change in all the characteristics listed on this slide. In addition, the issue about loss of physiologic reserve and decreased homeostatic control is really an important one. And those of us who are caring for older patients have to really drill down on this. So why do we lose that reserve? Or why is all the reserve being used? And, and, what ha and why can't you create more reserve or dip down? Well, there's probably two things that impact that. One is allostatic load, and that's persistent activation of normal neuroendocrine, immune, and autonomic responses to stress. So let's think about it. So, you know, in your life as you, as you get older, well, maybe you, you have chicken pox when you were a kid, and, and uh, then you, you had pneumonia at some point, and then you got a, a bout of hepatitis, and then you started to develop heart disease, and then you had arthritis. And so you see the numbers of disease states that you're having to address and bear continue to increase and increase the allostatic load, not to mention the other things in your life that are stressful. Not that it's not stressful being in high school or middle school, etc., but as we age and the consequences of our decisions become more serious, that's also a stress. But we also may have high stress jobs. Or in our 30s or 40s, our family members, our parents may die. And so you see the stresses increase as this allostatic load increases. The other is that even when you experience a stressful event, your body doesn't respond in the same way. You don't bounce back in the same way when you're 50 as you did when you're 20. As we all pretty much know, these changes with aging are generally irreversible. Now, the anti-aging groups might have a different opinion, but healthy interventions may slow down aging may help you maintain better health, but generally do not reverse aging. So this is a child with progeria. It's a disease state whereby you age very rapidly. And there have been studies on individuals with progeria to help us understand aging better. So, uh, these individuals usually die at age 13 due to the diseases that plague many of us well into our 60s and 70s, such as stroke or heart attack. Now, there is a disorder, a variant of uh, progeria called the Hutchinson-Guilford progeria, and it's linked to mutations in the nuclear structural protein lamin A, and it's caused by a tiny point mo uh, mutation on a single gene. There's also Werner's syndrome that's also been studied as a disease of premature aging. Patients may live to their 20s, but then they rapidly develop arteriosclerosis, cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, etc. This disorder is also linked to a single gene on chromosome 8, which encodes for DNA helicase. It's been cloned, and people are studying this right now, because the helicases are exactly what helps repair and replicate and helps us express genetic material. And although these disorders are linked to single genes, many of the individuals studying aging have turned away from the single gene theory and that there's probably a whole set of complex interactions with differing systems of the body, not to mention what's in our environment that probably impact aging instead of just the one gene. 
So our next objective is to describe the changes that occur in the cell. Because if we understand the cell level, it'll help us understand the organism better. So there are morphological alterations, enzyme function changes, gene expressions, and the telomere shortened. Now, aging is caused by changes in gene expression. That would make sense, right? You know, the genes change over time. Compared with younger adults, the elderly can have decreased, unchanged, or increased rates of gene expression. So, there may be mutations in DNA sequences, there may be latent viral infections like the herpes virus, or accumulation of environmentally induced cell damage. Think of skin cancer. It's really unknown whether age-related changes in gene expression are functionally significant, or that's just something that occurs as one gets older. But either way, this is an area of great study. So, primary changes in gene expression with age result in decreased transcription rates, decreased messenger RNA turnover, and decreased inducibility of the genes, such as immediate early genes, acute phase reactants, and stress genes. So just think about how this contributes to a, an altered physiologic response to an illness. Now the expression of genes related to stress res response is upregulated as we get older. Now we don't know what that means, we just, we know it occurs, and maybe it's an adaptation to accumulated environmental or oxidative stress. Still under study. There is a theory that there's codon restriction and that the um, messenger RNA translation is impaired because the body is unable to decode the, the codons in the mRNA structure. There's an error catastrophe theory, and that's a decline in the fidelity of gene expression over time that results in an increased portion of abnormal proteins. So that makes sense and may lead us to help understand why cancers are more prominent in older patients. I mean, two-thirds of everyone who has cancer is over the age of 65. So something happens. It's not that there's no cancer in, in younger age, but that there's a preponderance of cases as we get older. There can be disdifferentiation. It's a gradual accumulation of random molecular damage over time. So that impairs gene expression. And then the cell, your theory of aging. Basically, the cell commits suicide. It changes and changes until it can no longer sustain its viability. There may be replicative senescence, and so we're in some organs the cells should be growing, but um, that changes for some reason, or the function changes. So the numbers change, or the function changes. And then there's a, a greater heterogeneity in the cell sizes, and maybe the cells get larger, like the fat cells as we get older or increase in the size of the nucleus or nucleolus or other parts of the cell. The Golgi apparatus in our cells becomes more prominent and there's a whole series of things that can occur like increased number of cytoplasmic microfilaments, vacuolated cytoplasm, and large lysosomal bodies that you see in the fibroblasts in older individuals. Now it makes sense to me in the cellular senescence theory that each cell has a maximum number of divisions before it attains old age. So it will grow, 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 and at some point it lacks the juice to do so. This may be related to the length of the telomere end of the DNA chain, which shortens with each division. So you basically run out of telomere and there's less telomerase activity actually observed. The telomere is, is a region of highly replicative DNA at the end of the chromosome, and it functions as a sort of a disposable buffer. So you make a new cell and you get rid of that piece. The area and study of telomeres is very important, both in cancer and in aging, and I would look to that in the future as a real area of potential uh, treatment to reverse or improve quality of life in older individuals or those with cancer. So I mentioned already that the telomeres are protein DNA structures and you know they stabilize the chromosome ends. They may do a little bit more 
and they prevent degradation and they prevent the other genes from fusing and they may also play a role in the determination of chromosomal localization within the nucleus and they may actually be the piece that regulates cells as they continue to replicate. Aged cells with a proliferative potential exhibit telomere shortening and so as I said before, this is a link to cancer and to human aging. So the next theory that we're taking a look at is the oxidative stress theory. And that's where oxidative metabolism produces reactive oxygen and it can damage protein, lipids, and DNA. And, uh, you know, it seems like a pretty solid theory because there's clear mutations in oxidative stress pathway that can extend life. And there's other uh, mutations that increase longevity. However, giving people antioxidants doesn't seem to really delay aging and disease. So, although this is, mutations in oxidative stress pathways are uh, something observed, we have yet been able to demonstrate reversing these or upregulating this or extending this makes any difference. There is an apoptosis theory and that is every cell lives then dies and that's all programmed and when you hit a genome crisis you die. There's also the neuroendocrine theory that shows the changes in the neuroendocrine control of homeostasis result in aging-related physiologic alterations. And you know, just think about individuals who have diabetes. They have changes in almost all their organ systems. And so, you know, the thyroid, the same thing. You know, anybody has a thyroid disease, whether it's hypo or hyperthyroid, these disease states can affect the entire body. So that there is at least a component of neuroendocrine disarray in aging makes a lot of sense to many. Look at, in the hypothalamus, all the hormones that could possibly be affected. And, you know, the thyroid growth hormone, luteinizing hormone, ACTH. However, we don't have a direct causality between these, and if you supplement all, oh, for instance, these stimulating hormones, you know, you really don't see change in aging. So, although it may be related, we are just not sure to what degree and exactly how. The other thing is, you become more immune to diseases as your immune state weakens. And we all know that older people are more prone to infectious disease and there's an increased autoimmune disease state in older adults. Well, you th uh, think about just influenza. S older people don't always mount a strong a response to the flu vaccine. That's why many states, including ours here in Texas, require that the healthcare workers that are around the older individuals get vaccinated so that they don't pass on the virus to them. So what really happens is that there's a problem in T cell function as we age. And you can see that it would make us more susceptible to infections and cancer. You know, lymphocytes proliferate more slowly. There's diminished cloning efficiency of T cells and there's fewer population doublings of fibroblasts. So some diseases are associated with aging, but you know, if we replace, for instance, or enhance T cell function, we don't really see an improvement or more healthy aging. And so, what might work in improving healthy aging? Well, perhaps some mutations, stimulating mutations in certain genes like growth hormone might. However, if you have untreated growth hormone deficiency, your lifespan is shorter. And low expressing IGF-1 receptor alleles are more highly represented among long-lived humans. So maybe you're not supposed to have that much. Anyway, these targets that we've talked about are potential for drugs to delay age-related diseases and changes. 
So I talked about a lot of these theories and individuals are studying telomeres and, and the different uh, oxidative stress and antioxidants. Does that really help us extend the lifespan of, of our patients in 2014? Well, maybe some. About 50% of seniors use vitamins, but the research is confounded. Last year, in internal medicine publication, there was a, an extensive article about how many vitamins don't do much uh, for individuals, and they really just add to the medication burden. Elders are often excluded from these trials anyway. And I get asked all the time as a practicing geriatrician, do I need a daily multivitamin, doc? And if you're eating properly, we say no. You know, many years ago, folate was added to different foods, but this could mask B12 deficiency in older people. Does glucosamine, an over-the-counter nutritional supplement or pill, a treatment if you will, help some with moderate arthritis, many people get no benefit from it. And what about vitamin D? We know large portions of the population of older people are deficient in vitamin D, but does replacing it really reduce disease burden? Further study needs to be done. About omega-3 fatty acids, do they help? Do we really need coenzyme Q10? Is green tea good for us? Lower in caffeine, is it helpful? Does it have any medicinal benefits? Not clear. We do know that growth hormone, while it can build up muscle bulk, there's not really a functional increase in the muscle and it may lead to joint pain, worse than diabetes. The best, very best thing that will extend life is exercise. It's clear, it's been proven in multiple studies. This is a principle that applies that whether you are two or you're 92, and older people can benefit no matter what age they start in, uh, in increasing exercise. We know that it decreased folds. We know that you can better use the glucose you take in at the muscle level. It makes your heart stronger, if you will. You're more flexible. You sleep better, and there's less depression and dementia. And yes, I said dementia. Exercise has been proven to decrease or prevent dementia. And of course, less hip and knee pain due to arthritis, which is likely, if not the most common disease state in the United States, it's one of the top three. The other two being visual impairment and auditory impairment. So what about the theories about caloric restriction? The woman in the last slide was happy because she keeps her calories down, her weight is in the normal range, and she has, has an increased well-being. There's been a lot of studies that talk about caloric restriction increasing average and maximum lifespans. They've looked at it in mice and flies and Oh, they measured body temperature, reduced plasma insulin, and even in older men and monkeys. But it's really not clear if the caloric restriction helps because there have been just as many studies that show being 10 to 15 pounds overweight may be helpful. I think it's pretty clear that being very obese or very underweight is not healthy for you at any age, but particularly as your reserves decline in older age. Now, SIR2 is an enzyme in the sirtuin family of proteins, and it mediates the benefits of caloric restriction in yeast. And so, a SIR2 is in resveratrol, and that's a plant phenol in, in red wine, and it, there's anti-inflammatory, anti-oxidant, uh, anti-cancer effects, and more research is being done to see if the SIR2 or the SIR2 inactivating compounds will have a highly significant impact not only on aging and, and healthy aging but on disease states and can they be used as treatments. It's also pretty clear that uh, religious participation improves health and well-being. There have been thousands of studies 
that have looked at the impact of religious participation and have shown a positive effect in a myriad of diseases, including diabetes, cancer, dementia, alcoholism. And it's more than just the social aspects. Religious participation it's, is important for the actual observance in the religious rituals or services, mass. No one is exactly clear why that is. And it is non-denominational. Uh, whatever your faith background, if you have one, if you participate, it's been shown in seniors to impart health benefits. So I want to move on now to another learning objective, and that is how do we differentiate between normal aging, usual aging, and successful aging? And we all, I actually like all of those. Uh, I like the successful aging probably best. So normal aging is associated with progressive and universal physiologic changes, and we know that. Usual aging includes age-related disease, but successful aging occurs when there's minimal health events and it's associated with preserved function until very advanced age. So here's a case. 78-year-old woman undergoes total knee replacement for osteoarthritis. She has some post-operative bleeding and severe pain. She's given morphine. She stops eating very well. She drops her um, potassium and becomes delirious. She develops Ogilvy syndrome where her gut doesn't work and it becomes distended and a nasogastric tube is placed. Her rehab is delayed. She spends a week in the hospital and a two-week stay in the SNF. After discharge, she develops a wound infection requiring daily IV antibiotics as an outpatient and has a six-month recovery period. And so, look at this event. The, you know, the hospital stay now is less than three days, but look at all the things that happened to this woman and how there was a cascade of events likely due to her advanced age because her, her medical history revealed a little hypertension and that's it. So let's talk about some of the things that plague older people and why they're so common and what's different about them and how we can prevent the cascade of problems that we saw in our patient here with the knee replacement. So why is hyperglycemia in the setting of infection so common in old people? We will see a big bounce in the blood sugar level. And that's because there's decreased insulin sensitivity. And so there's increased random blood sugars in the elderly, although their fasting glucose doesn't change. And if you can see on this graph, the top slide is very old patient and the, the top line that is in red and the blue is very young. And you can see the difference. So glucose responsiveness becomes unaltered. Even when catecholamines and corticosteroids are on board, there's a higher frequency of hyperglycemia in all the people. They release more steroids with illness. They have enhanced release of steroids and catecholamine in illness, but a higher frequency of hyperglycemia. Why is apathetic hyperthyroidism essentially unique to old people? And so apathetic hyperthyroidism is a clinical state where the patient for all of our clinical evaluation appears to have low thyroid, hypothyroid, but biochemically they're hyperthyroid. And the reason is that there's decreased beta adrenergic sensitivity as we age. So if you look at this table that looks at heart rate, the development of AFib, lid lag, fine skin tremor, you can see how these findings of hyperthyroidism change with age. You know, in the 30 to 50 year old, 100% is gonna have a heart rate over 100 if they're hyperthyroid, but look at the 171 to 90, only 28% will. New onset AFib, 20% in that population. Lid lag is less common, fine skin is less common, and tremor is less common. So aside from the AFib, older people can look like a hypothyroid patient when they actually have hyperthyroidism. And that's because there's decreased vasodilatation in response to beta agonists. And you know, many of these manifestations of hyperthyroidism are adrenergically mediated. 
there is a decreased sensitivity of the beta adrenergic receptors. However, the number is unchanged or maybe a little high. The next clinical issue is why do lipid soluble drugs have such long half lives in older people? Well, I have news for you. Fat mass, as we alluded to earlier, increases in older patients. And so if you take a look at the body composition of a 25-year-old in this graph compared to a 75-year-old, you see that the fat content increases. And so there's a 50% or more increase body fat in men and also in women. And there's increased half-life for lipid-soluble drugs. So now that, you know, there's more fat, they're going to stick around longer and they actually can be stored in the body. We all have seen with great dismay that older patients seem to get more pressure sores than younger ones. And this graph depicts the reason why. As we age, our skin becomes less thick. I mean, it's just very clear, they're almost half and we lose thickness in all three of our skin layers. We lose elastin. We flattening of the dermal epidermal junction and this decreased sensation of pressure related comfort. Also, older people are less able to convert vitamin D from the sun into the, a usable form in their bodies, the aging changes in the skin. Now, why do older gentlemen or women get toxic on normal doses of digoxin or vancomycin. So you might understand that both digoxin and vancomycin are cleared to the kidneys. And so total body water is needed to help dilute these medications. And so total body water with age, you see linearly declines. It may decrease 15 to 20 percent in men and that increases the concentration for water-soluble drugs. And this decrease is further magnified by renal function. I've always wondered why we don't dose based on lean body mass, like is done for so many cancer drugs or what's done for children. You know, we give the same dose of a thrombotic agent, for instance, to a 350 pound person who's an adult as we do to a 150 pound person. So I think when you're dealing with older patients, to keeping in mind their true lean body mass is a very important precept. Now, why is a heart rate of 120 in an 80 year old in the setting of an infection equivalent to a 170 in a 25 year old? That's because there's decreased maximum heart rate as you get older. And so you can see again on this graph, there's a linear decline. So the heart rate of 120 in a 75-year-old man is roughly 75% of the maximum heart rate and the same as a 170 to 20-year-old. And so it's important that when there's stress, the heart rate will not increase. However, now the resting heart rate doesn't change with age and that's important to understand. Now, why do elderly patients develop congestive heart failure so frequently when they go into atrial fibrillation? Well, older people, or all of us as we age, we have an increased dependence on atrial systole to fill our left ventricle. So you can see that the early diastolic filling volume declines with age, while diastolic filling due to atrial contraction increases with age. And so if you're younger, the left atrial systole just sort of tops off the ventricle. But in older people, atrial systole provides 40% of the filling. And so when you have AFib and you lose the coordinated pump action of your atria, it's manifested as heart failure and a low cardiac output. Well, why is CHF with normal left ventricular systolic function so common in old people? I think that it's really missed. You know, we evaluate left ventricular function at rest in older people. However, there is a marked impairment in diastolic function as we age. So impaired relaxation of muscles has been demonstrated in the hearts of older animals. 
is an impaired resequestration of calcium due to decreased levels of sarcoplasma reticulum calcium pump. Restoring pump protein normalizes function in studies and impaired tolerance of the volume load like IV fluids can occur because of diastolic dysfunction. So diastolic measures are also better predictors of maximum exercise performance in the elderly. And increased diastolic heart failure occurs because disease-related changes are superimposed on age-related ones. So you think about it, it's very common in clinical practice to give an excess volume to older people because the, as the cavity is smaller and the muscle is thicker, it may not take much to throw them into heart failure. And conversely, they may very easily have a low volume state if they're not hydrated enough. So it's, it's the skilled clinician that knows to give a little but not too much in their older patients because of these changes in diastolic function. Now why is systolic hypertension so common in older people? In younger 50 and 40 year olds we worry a bit more about the systolic dysfunction but isolated systolic hypertension is common in older people. And that's because as we age, our arteries stiffen. And so look at big jump between 30 and 90 to the stiffness of our arteries. So it's probably due to collagen and elastin. There's less cushioning function. And this is really what occurs in the large arteries. Now it's not necessarily atherosclerosis, so there's no vascular blocking but the diameter and length of the aortic increases. And so you add the stiffened arteries on top of all the other changes that occur with aging and you wind up with the systolic hypertension. Why are older patients so prone to orthostatic hypotension? I can tell you that this is such an important precept that every patient in our geriatric clinics at the University of Texas Medical School, Houston, gets an orthostatic blood pressure at every visit. So, we already talked about there's decreased baroreceptor sensitivity and that the arteries are less compliant and in fact the heart is less compliant because of that, the diastolic dysfunction that can occur. This results in impaired brain perfusion, which may not give the uh, proper feedback loop, decreased renal sodium conversion, decreased plasma volume, the veins become more tortuous, there's blunted response to vasopressin, and there's decreased renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone levels. Now, there is impaired beta-adrenergic vasodilatation, which may be helpful, and there's normal alpha-adrenergic vasoconstriction, so the alpha receptors stay pretty normal. But, you know, all of the predisposing factors well outweigh the protective factors and older individuals fall because of orthostatic hypotension. What we as clinicians have to be guarded against is giving them medications that worsen this physiologic effect. So, I got up this morning, you know, I really did have enough time to go down and exercise for about 30 minutes, but I said, uh, I'll do it when I come home. And uh, I think it's, be it's because physical activity becomes a bit harder as we get older. And so why is that? Well, one reason is that there's a decrease in your VO2 max. And so all activities become a larger relative percent of the VO2 max and, the, and you perceive them as harder. This VO2 max decreases due to cardiac plus muscle factors and you know not exercising for a while may lower your vo2 max further though if you exercise you'll improve it but i look at that linear decline and i see where i am kind of in the middle of that graph and uh i can say yes all of that stuff occurs and it's all it's all correct now why do older people develop hypoxia in response to so many challenges good clinical pearl to check oxygen even if people don't report breathing problems. That's because the VQ mismatching occurs in normal aging lungs to a greater extent. And again, you see that sort of that same graph we've been seeing about a lot of things. There's a linear decline 
and PaO2 as we get older. And so it's about four millimeters of mercury per decade. And of course, it's worse when you lie flat. And although you don't have the sensation of hypoxia, rather you have the preserved sensation of hypoxia, but an impaired sensation of hypercapnia in old people. And so they can become drowsy and delirious and confused. It can happen before they ever recognize that there's a change going on. So it's pretty clear that all of us are aspirating a little bit every day. That's a physiologic known fact. But why do older patients get aspiration pneumonia to a greater extent? Well, it's because they have decreased lung elasticity in a larger residual volume. So there is an um, increase in the ineffectiveness of the cough, an increase in closing volume not cleared by cough. And the lungs just become stiffer like many other parts of us. And the fibronectin is stickier for bacteria in the oropharynx and there's decreased mucillary transport and then slower recovery after something happens. The epiglottis decreases in competency and then of course we talked about the immune senescence that occurs and so you put all this together and you're more likely to get pneumonia. But an important issue that comes up in board exams is to remember that there is larger residual volume in older patients. Why do older people so often get confused or develop delirium in the face of infections? You know, there's been so much wonderful work done by geriatricians in this country on delirium. We are able to detect it thanks to the work of Inouye and others, and we've looked at it postoperatively thanks to the work of Mark Antonio. And there's been modification of these tools in ICU patients, and we all have looked at the data that show that delirium imparts a higher rate of mortality and morbidity on our patients, regardless of cause. Well. There is a problem with the cholinergic pathways in the brain. There's a decrease in choline acetyltransferase in older hippocampi and the neocortex. And the frequency of delirium can be as high as 60 to 70 percent. And it increases if you're demented. And you know, there, there have been debates about whether delirium ever clears. The data are becoming more conclusive to show that not all delirium is reversible as I was taught in my training and, and taught for many years until these data became apparent. But we have seen patients who remain delirious and have behavioral problems, provide great stress to the families and themselves because the delirium occurs. We have to do everything we can to prevent delirium from ever occurring rather than having the difficult task of treating it. And it's probably 25 to 30 percent don't really clear. Now why does a brief bout of bed rest debilitate an older patient so much? Well, older people have marginal muscle strength. You know, between age 20 and 70 we lose 50 percent of strength in our legs. And it's not all that linear. The older you get, the worse it is. Upper body strength decreases less rapidly than does lower body strength, but so you see we have so many folds. Older people might have muscle mass, but not the function and strength. And the issue might be at the neuromuscular junction. There's a dropout of the neurons. And so, you know, the muscle unit, although it increases, it doesn't really respond. However, this can be reversed with training. And there, has, there are studies that demonstrate the benefits of exercise and weight training in people in their 90s. Of course, the older muscle is injured more easily, and there's a loss of 5% of strength per day of immobilization. So just think about it. You're in the hospital three days, 15% loss of strength. Very serious, very serious. That's why it's so important to mobilize our patients after any event. And, and that's the type of determination we make on the day of admission. They should be able to sit up in bed or, or do this exercise or progress in this way in their muscle strength 
And we need to see that at the very first day of admission. You may have had many patients who had a low sodium or hyponatremia. And it's very frequent in older people because, as I mentioned a little bit earlier about the changes in the kidney, there's an impaired ability to excrete a water load. And they often can't retain salt in the proper response to an illness. There is an impaired non-osmotic stimulation of uh, antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, released by the bowel receptor. And increased osmotic receptor sensitivity with enhanced ADA release. And older people are more susceptible to the syndrome of inappropriate ADH. Now, there's a lot of concern about resurfacing of infections in older people. Tuberculosis can do it, but what we see a lot is in the herpes zoster virus and shingles, and that's a huge problem for older people. The risk of developing shingles increases exponentially with old age and affects up to a third of people over the age of 85. And it's because there's impaired cellular immunity, and so there's not the immunosurveillance we would like to see. And so your thymus, which makes a lot of the good infection-fighting cells, involute, it's gone by age 70. There's decreased the number of T cells. There's decreased in interleukin-2 production, decreased responsive of old memory cells, the CD45 positive cells, decreased skin test response for TB, but no change in the CD4, CD8 counts. However, you can see the older patient does not have the same response to the immunosurveillance. So as we age, we become more prone to the reactivation of certain illnesses. Folds are the sixth leading cause of death. There's so many syndromes associated with folds. We know that half of the people who fall have a hip fracture will be dead at one year. And so it's very important that we focus on folds. But, you know, we all trip. We all, you know, take a little tumble here and there. Why is this more frequent in the older patient? Well, there's increasing sway in older people without visual input. There's a slower reaction time so they don't recover. Slower light-dark accommodation. In fact, that's, you know, certain nursing homes and age facilities for older people are, are painted in a certain way to provide contrast. They lose cerebellar neurons, which control balance, and there's weakness of the ankle and knee musculature. Now, orthostatic hypotension, as we mentioned, and 50% of falls are accidental. Everybody will say, well, I, you know, it, it was just an accident. However, the consequences are quite serious. And nursing home patients, because they have all of this risk and are older, have an increased uh, percentage of falls. You can't practice uh, geriatric medicine without understanding how to treat urinary tract infections. And so we know that the bladder doesn't completely empty with age, and that the production of the TAM horsefall mucoprotein, which is supposed to protect against infection, is decreased. There's loss of bactericidal prostate secretions, and the urine becomes less acidic. Women's urethra atrophy in menopause, and uh, there's more vaginal secretions, more obstruction to the stones of the prostate, and there's a higher frequency of asymptomatic bacteria. And this is a critical point in older patients. The only manifestation might be the delirium that we mentioned a few slides back. And so you don't need the clear-cut symptomatology to diagnose a urinary tract in older patients. Be very in tune to the change in cognition, which is probably one of the most common manifestations. Along with urinary tract infections is urinary incontinence that is very common in older women, particularly starting at age 40. And so when you're hospitalized, it's even worse. And again, here's one of those bar graphs that just goes in the opposite direction. And so by the age 75, there's over 60% risk of developing incontinence, particularly in the hospital. Well, the pelvic muscles atrophy, the urethra atrophies, as we mentioned, there's decreased bladder capacity and sensitivity, 
and impaired mobility and so you're more likely to have incontinence which is a very embarrassing very distressing problem but can also contribute to skin breakdown and pressure sores well why does our lean body mass decrease with normal aging look at this decline of this graph and look at the MRI of the muscle what happens is there's a decrease in the IGF-1. You're less active, you lose androgen. The um, creatinine production decreases. You lose the total number of fibers, especially type 2. And so fat creeps into the muscle, as you can see on the picture on the right. The white part is the fat, and the actual muscle mass decreases. Exercise, however, can overcome this regardless of age. Now, when we talked about the, the levels of digoxin and vancomycin, we mentioned that the, the changes in total body water, however, kidney function decreases with age. And so, and I think this is probably a more important factor. So, how does it decrease? Well, the um, cranium clearance, and again, it's linear. And this is regardless of disease state. I'm not talking about patients who have hypertension, diabetes, or, or on some medications to reduce kidney function. D decreased cranial clearance by 35% in healthy older men. The kidney is less able to concentrate or dilute. Be you become isothenuric. There's an increased number of sclerotic glomeruli, maybe even a third becomes scarred. There's decrease in renal blood flow and renal mass and thus decreased clearance of renal drugs. And so all of us who prescribe have to keep that in mind with every medication to prescribe. And so if you don't know for sure uh, how a medication should be changed, you, you have to give it urgently, you, you can't, you, there's no place to look it up. or you or the data are not clear, you start by giving them a half or a third of the dose. And if they're frail, I give a third as a guideline until I'm able to measure uh, or even estimate cranial clearance. Why do older people get dehydrated so frequently? Well, we did mention a little bit about that, but they may also not even sense that they are thirsty. So there's impaired recognition of thirst and impaired retention of salt and water when they need to. And so, you know, the maximum urine concentration is poor, then the nephrons come scarred. And so uh, what we're looking at is really increased susceptibility to dehydration. And so if so many patients who fail to drink water for some reason, I've seen this clinically, they don't like the taste. So we talk to them about other liquids, maybe putting some fruit in it to, to change the taste of the water. But if you're caring for somebody or if you're instructing a family member who's caring for an individual that may have cognitive impairment uh, or doesn't express their thirst, you think about yourself. If you're thirsty, offer the elderly parent or the, or the elderly patient something to drink. Well, we have a lot of heat waves in Houston. In fact, this was a great summer because we didn't hit the 100s that much. Why is there an increased probability of developing hyperthermia for older patients? So they can't dissipate the heat in the same way they were able to when they were younger. Sweat production has decreased. The numbers of sweat glands has decreased. There are higher core temperatures. It takes higher core temperatures to start sweating. And the threshold to say, hey, it's too hot here, is increased in older people. And so they're less likely to become acclimatized. Their skin cannot vasodilate in the same way to dissipate the heat. So more hyperthermia. If you've ever tried to take a history or talk to your patient with the TV on, and when there were rooms where it shared patients, it's because there is a peripheral hearing problem, but there's also a central processing deficit. So older individuals have impaired voice discrimination, particularly when there's a lot of background noise. I will tell you, the older I've gotten, the less likely I like noisy restaurants. In fact, if you look on a restaurant rating social media outlets, you will see that the, the noise level of the restaurant is mentioned as part of uh, the evaluation. So uh, older people may not be able to discriminate between certain phonemes. 
Now this doesn't mean they're demented, it just means that the brain isn't working well with the information that comes in there, but it's not related to memory and thinking. So they may have ability to comprehend connected speech. They have that ability, but it's impaired as opposed to understanding a single word. And so that's helpful to us in knowing how to communicate to older people because we might break down the words and separate them more, just like this, so that they're easier to understand. Now, hearing aids may be effective if there's a peripheral problem somewhere in the, the ear, but if there's a central processing deficit, they won't work. The older listeners also much more sensitive to accents and to varying speakers than the young. So if we're younger, we may be able to sort that out, but uh, that's not the case with older individuals. Now, older people also metabolize drugs slower in their liver. And although I must say the GI tract of all the organ systems is the least affected by aging, we do see a problem with drug metabolism. So the liver changes a little bit less, the kidney much more, but there is decreased hepatic blood flow, decreased first pass metabolism of drugs like propranolol or verapamil or morphine, and the drugs that require oxidation is slower, and including those ones that are mediated by the P450 enzyme systems, such as warfarin or phenytoin or even naproxen, which is over the counter. And there's reduced inducibility of hepatic enzymes by barbiturates, rifampin, and even cigarette smoke. So I am at the uh, end of my talk, and I want to be sure to give credit to all the individuals whose work has contributed to this lecture. I will tell you that I hope that this discussion of both the theories of aging, but particularly on all the clinical situations that we went through, we'll help you understand the older patient better. We discussed multiple theories of aging, such as the neuroendocrine theory, the cell senescent theory, the genomic theories. But we also went through some very important changes in organ systems, such as decreased choline receptors in the brain, preponderance to delirium, decrease in the mass and function of the liver and to a greater extent the kidneys, the uh, decrease in total body water, the increase in body fat, the decrease in muscle mass, and we went on about the skin, etc. So what you can see and learn from this is that irrespective of diseases that occur, with aging there's a change in these organ systems and so that's all a part of normal aging. Usual aging is where there are the, the disease states, and we mentioned many of them, come into play. And successful aging is where our patients, and in conjunction with you and I, help decrease all the, the normal aging effects as well as the effects of disease states. And I'll leave you with this thought. There have been three things that are associated with successful aging. One of them is optimism. The second is resilience. And the third is a positive attitude for aging. Among all of these, these three things, optimism has the greatest impact on successful aging. And so as we become optimistic and more optimistic as data come through or become more skilled at taking care of older patients. We help our patients maintain their optimism for uh, advancing old age and we work together on interprofessional teams to promote successful aging in every patient that we meet. And so I want to give special thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kathleen Murphy, who put this lecture together with me. And I wish you all great success in uh, treating your older patients. On behalf of the uh, Houston Geriatric Education Center and the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, thank you for listening to this lecture.